Okay, I think we should get started. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Monona Terrace's virtual right design series zoom edition we thank you for joining us welcome to first timers if you're a regular we are happy to have you with us again it's definitely curl up under a blanket weather here in wisconsin so it's great for virtual viewing my name is heather sabin i'm program coordinator at monona terrace and as you know, since our building has closed in March and remains closed to the public, we are uh, facilitating our right lectures uh, on a once a month basis uh, here virtually. Our presenter today is happy to take some questions after our pre presentation. What I'd like for you to do is use the Q&A function to ask your questions. Um, you can ask them at any time during the presentation, but we will address them following Kieran's presentation at that time. We'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as we can. So some of you have already asked in the Q&A whether or not there will be uh, a way to view this afterwards. We are recording this session and we need a few days time to get this going, but we put up the recording on our website go to mononaterrace.com slash webinars, and you will see a virtual library there. So all you need to do is click on Write Design Series, and it will take you to a page that has all of our recordings so far. With that said, uh, we are going to introduce our speaker today. Kieran Murphy grew up on the East Coast, she went to college in Boston and attended UW-Madison for graduate school. She started giving tours in 1994 while getting her master's degree at Madison. Uh, she has been the historian at Taliesin Preservation, the organization that runs the Taliesin tour program. And as that historian, she has done research and writing about the buildings on the Taliesin estate. She's given presentations on those buildings and write and has answered questions from both the public and Taliesin tour staff. Her writing on Taliesin includes an autobiography in Wood and Stone for the Frank Lloyd Wright Quarterly in summer 2018. And you can go find those on franklloydwright.org website. And she has served as a consultant on several books about Wright and Taliesin, including Plagued by Fire, The Dreams and Furies of Frank Lloyd Wright by Paul Hendrickson, and Building Taliesin, Frank Lloyd Wright's Home of Love and Loss by Ron McRae. She has her master's degree in art history from UW-Madison, and she has a website, kieranmurphy.com. And just on a personal note, I've known Kieran a long time. She and I were tour guides back in the 90s at Taliesin, and mm. I really uh, uh, respect and appreciate all the research that she's done there and the expertise she's mm. developed. And she is so generous in sharing that. So. Thank you so much, Karen, for doing this today, and I will turn it over to you. Oh, well, thank you, Heather. That I'm a little, uh, I'm blushing, but of course you can't tell uh, with the Zoom profile. Um, yes, yeah, so I would like to thank Heather and Monona Terrace for allowing me to speak today. Um, of course, with the COVID situation, uh, not all of us are able to go out to Frank Lloyd Wright buildings. And so uh, these webinars are a way for us Francophiles out here to kind of um, replenish our desire to see Wright buildings. Um, and I think it's uh, really appropriate that I'm able to do this because Taliesin and uh, the, the village of Spring Green is only about 45 minutes away from uh, the city of Madison and from Monona Terrace. So, oh, before I, I show where Ta uh, Taliesin is on the map, of course, I should explain the uh, first photograph we've got here. Uh, this is uh, uh, the girl in question, Yovana, Yovana Lloyd Wright with her parents, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright and Olga Vanna Lloyd Wright. Um, and I'm going to be talking about 
the changes made to Taliesin. Taliesin is about a 45 minute drive west of Madison. And Taliesin is on the Taliesin estate. And here's an aerial of the estate. The estate is 800 acres, uh, which is about 240 something hectares. Uh, 600 of those 800 acres were owned by Frank Lloyd Wright. And uh, they have five Frank Lloyd Wright designed buildings on them. And in the aerial photograph th uh, that's in this slide, all of his buildings are on the left-hand side of the photograph. Um, and at the top uh, is uh, the structure, the complex of Taliesin that I'll be talking a little bit about. Uh, and Taliesin and the estate uh, is in a valley that was originally settled in the 1860s by Frank Lloyd Wright's mother's side of the family. They were named the Lloyd Joneses and they had come to Wisconsin from Wales. And there were 10 children in the Lloyd Jones family. Uh, one of the daughters was Anna Lloyd Jones and she would give birth to Frank Lloyd Wright in 1867. Wright was born in 1867 and lived until 1959. Um, and Anna's brother, uh, James Lloyd Jones, lived out in the valley. And I have a photograph from 1930 taken in the valley. Um, and so I think it, it shows it a lot better than the aerial. And you can see the little hills in the distance. Uh, Wright said later that nowhere else in the world do the hills so softly enfold you as here in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, and Wright was sent out to the valley to work in the farm of Uncle James, uh, James Lloyd Jones, um, every summer between uh, the age of 11 until 18. And actually, Uncle James's farm is probably somewhere around here in this photo, but I've got a contemporary photograph of uh, the farm building. And of course, it's right underneath the arrow there. Um, that building is called El Deberon, which uh, means the wanderer or the follower. It was purchased by Frank Lloyd Wright's son-in-law, Wes Peters. Uh, but um, so Wright came out every summer between turning, uh, when he turned 11 to when he turned 18. Uh, and then he's gonna come back to the Valley in 1911 to start his home. So he's born in 1867, he's coming out to the Valley in the 1870s and 80s. And then he comes back in 1911. So what happened uh, during that period of time? Obviously, I'm not gonna give you a very long explanation of it because most of you probably know, uh, but uh, when Wright was around 18 or 19 years old, he left Wisconsin and he went to uh, Chicago to try to become an architect. And he ended up working for a famous architect named Louis Sullivan. And uh, Wright worked with Sullivan for about four and a half years until the age of 25 or 26. Uh, and uh, at that time, uh, Wright lived in a suburb of Chicago called Oak Park. He would live there from 1889 until 1909, so for 20 years. Uh, he was in Oak Park and he designed and built a home there. And he lived with his first wife, Catherine, and they would have six children together. And while he was in Oak Park, he became known for his first style of architecture called the Prairie Style, and beautiful little homes for people. Uh, and uh, around 1903, so a couple of years after he really 
formulated the prairie style. Uh, around 1903, he gets a commission for a house from Edwin and May Machini, who were neighbors uh, in Oak Park. And Frank Lloyd Wright and May Machini began a romantic relationship probably around 1906. Uh, and they carried on this um, affair for several years until they both decided to leave Oak Park. And uh, that was in 1909. They go to Europe together. They're in Europe for about a year. And then Frank Lloyd Wright comes back in 1910. Uh, and Mema Machini stayed in Europe um, awaiting for a divorce from her husband. But Frank Lloyd Wright uh, wants to come back to the Valley. So uh, he found a hill that he really wanted. His mother purchased the hill for him in 1911. And he would design a house around the hill. And uh, he named it Taliesin, which is a Welsh word that means shining or radiant brow, like the brow of a forehead. And I've chosen this photograph here because uh, you can really see that the living quarters of Taliesin are not on the crown of the hill, they are on the brow of the hill. Taliesin also included uh, his drafting studio and farm structures that start here on the left. I'll, I'll show you a photograph of the farm structures uh, later, but we're gonna be concentrating on the living quarters. Uh, Wright uh, will start building the house in uh, May of 1911. Mema Chini will divorce her husband and she'll take back her maiden name, which was Borthwick. And so Mema Borthwick comes to live at Taliesin in uh, August of 1911. Uh, those two, Frank Lloyd Wright and Mema Borthwick will live at Taliesin for three years together. And then uh, in August of 1914, a servant uh, set the living quarters of Taliesin on fire and uh, murdered seven people at Taliesin, including Mema Borthwick. Uh, fortunately, Frank Lloyd Wright was not in Wisconsin that day. He was in Chicago and uh, he came back and he told a reporter the next day that he would rebuild Taliesin exactly as it was. And he uh, will call this rebuilt Taliesin, Taliesin II. And this, the part of the building over here on the right is the section that burned down. I've chosen this uh, photograph because it shows you the three parts of the building. Uh, living quarters on the right, office and drafting studio on either side of the chimney, and then uh, farm buildings on the left-hand side. Oh, also looking at this uh, slide um, allows me to uh, tell you about something. Uh, on this slideshow, I've tried to put in images, photographs, or drawings uh, that were, uh, that are, that, excuse me, that have been published or that are available online. And so I put the publishing information down at the bottom of each slide and also uh, where on the internet. Uh, you can find these uh, after the presentation. Anyway, so Taliesin II is going to last for about 10 years. And during those 10 years, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright will work on the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, and actually, there's a little uh, uh, pot here that he purchased while he was on the Imperial Hotel Commission. And also uh, during those 10 years, he will meet Mary and be left by his second wife. Her name is Miriam. Uh, she'll leave him in April of 1924. And then in 
November of 1924, Frank Lloyd Wright was in Chicago with a friend. They decide to go to the ballet on a Sunday matinee. And it was a full house, except for one, uh, one untaken chair next to Frank Lloyd Wright. And right before the lights came up or lights went down, uh, a young woman was ushered in uh, to the ballet. And Frank Lloyd Wright says later that uh, she looked aristocratic. He said, perhaps French or Russian? He wasn't sure. He was very intrigued by this beautiful young woman. And uh, they spoke after uh, the performance. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright asks her to tea. Her name was Olga Vanna. And uh, Wright writes later that uh, he said, I was in love with her. It was as simple as that. So it seems that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, fell in love with her, you know, upon meeting her. And the feeling was mutual. Old Gavana uh, apparently fell in love with Frank Lloyd Wright also when she met him. So they meet in November of 1924 and Old Gavana will move to Taliesin, Taliesin II. Uh, it, by January of 1925, she's not alone. She's with her daughter, Svetlana. Uh, and then in April, of 1925, a second fire happened at Taliesin. Same part of the building was destroyed as what was destroyed in the first fire, the living quarters, uh, pretty much burned down to the uh, stone. And uh, Wright was fighting the fire himself along with the uh, worker and probably old Gabbana. And uh, finally he said, let it all go. Uh, the fire was an electrical fire, probably caused by an incoming uh, lightning storm. Fortunately, right after Wright said, let it all go, the, uh, the rain finally came and it doused the fire. And uh, Wright said, while he was recovering from all of this, um, that Olga Vanna told him, Taliesin lives wherever you stand. So he's able to get back to work on the house. And so he redesigns Taliesin and he names it Taliesin III. Uh, what Frank Lloyd Wright may not have known in April of 1925, Olga Vanna may have known it. Uh, Olga Vanna was carrying Frank Lloyd Wright's child. And uh, that would be Yovana. And Yovana was born in December of 1925. She wasn't born in Wisconsin. She was born in Chicago. Uh, at that time, uh, she was with her parents, Frank Lloyd Wright and Olga Vanna, uh, and uh, with her sister, Svetlana. Uh, December of 1925 is kind of the beginning of some legal and personal problems that Frank Lloyd Wright is going to have. He's going to have legal, personal, and professional problems for several years. Uh, and that is going to keep uh, these four people away from Taliesin. Uh, but fortunately, Frank Lloyd Wright had as he was redesigning Taliesin, he had designed the living quarters with three bedrooms, which, uh, which would house himself and Old Gavana and uh, Svetlana and Jovana. Um, he's able to marry Old Gavana in August of 1928. Uh, he is able to acquire Taliesin, um, you know, because they were away from Taliesin for a little bit because of the financial problems, but he's able to reacquire the building. And all of them come back to Taliesin 
uh, by November of 1928. And here's a photograph of Svetlana with her little sister, Yovana at Taliesin. The living quarters of Taliesin are behind them in this photograph. Um, they're here for a few months and then they went down to Arizona so Frank Lloyd Wright could work on a project. And Wright works to, or he writes to his, um, his handyman, John Davies. He's writing to him in March of 1928 and he's, uh, or 1929. And he's describing coming back to Taliesin. And he says that uh, little Yovana uh, is a little homesick and she keeps saying, I want to go back to Taliesin. When can we go back to Taliesin? So uh, fortunately, they were able to come back um, after the trip to Arizona. They're able to come back uh, by late May of 1929. And here's a photograph of Frank Lloyd Wright with little Yovana at Taliesin in 1929. And then we'll look back at uh, the living quarters. I'm going to take us inside the living quarters a little bit here. Uh, this photograph that you see here shows a lot of stone on the outside. There's going to be stone on the inside of the building as well. Uh, and then uh, we'll, I'll show you the bedroom that Frank Lloyd Wright shared with old Gabbana. It's right back from where that young guy is standing. I do regret that I do not have photographs of those two bedrooms that Svetlana and Yovana would have lived in in the late 1920s to early 1930s. I don't know of any place where those photographs have uh, arisen at all. But uh, this is uh, the Wright's bedroom. Uh, and uh, we'll return to this photograph uh, once or twice more. I'm going to take you into the living room of Talias, and it's uh, right on the other side of the wall. And I wanted to show you this photograph because it shows uh, that a little child is living at Talias. And this was a professionally taken photograph. Uh, so obviously, Frank Lloyd Wright and the photographer would have arranged things around the room, but Wright, uh, I think Wright probably allowed the photographer to uh, keep this uh, picture of this little uh, play ball and a maraca in the photograph since there was a three-year-old child living at Taliesin in 1929. So. Um, this period of the late 1920s uh, was what Wright sometimes said later was uh, he was in the realm of ideas. He didn't have a lot of commissions coming in, but he did a lot of interesting things. Uh, he wrote a lot of articles. Uh, he also did some illustrations. And he and Olga Vanna began to think of creating a group on the Taliesin estate that would learn from him, a group that were um, apprentices and that would be both men and women uh, working and living with him. They called it the Taliesin Fellowship and it was founded in 1932. And here's a, a little bit from one of the first brochures on the fellowship. Uh, and I've chosen uh, what he wrote here because it goes along with what he was hoping young architectural apprentices would learn under him. He, would, he said that they would have direct work experience uh, seeing idea as work and work as idea. 
He would have them work on uh, one of the buildings on the estate called Hillside. He would also have them work at uh, his residence, Taliesin. Of course, that's going to come into what he did for Yovana. But I wanted to show you this uh, photograph here uh, of all of, well, pretty much all of the apprentices at that time, about nine, and they're all standing there around 1934. Uh, over by the car is Yovana, or uh, excuse me, Olgavana uh, with Yovana. So. Uh, and um, Svetlana was not at Taliesin when this photograph was taken. She was going to be away for a few years. Uh, so Frank Lloyd Wright uh, has uh, some space and he's got these young apprentices and he sets them to work on his uh, residence. Uh, and I've pointed out here this section of, of the uh, residence because there's this is where young apprentices will make changes to Taliesin for Yovana herself. So they will get practical experience uh, doing things. Uh, and this is a photograph that I uh, got from a movie that was taken in 1933 by an early apprentice named Alden Dow, who became a practicing architect later. And uh, it shows the apprentices building and uh, work, they are working and building on Yovana's bedroom. So uh, if you look back here where the chimney is, just uh, the next photograph will show the left side of the chimney on the left side of the photograph. So they're, they're building up. Um, and they completed construction of the bedroom in uh, February of 1934. And we know that because uh, the apprentices uh, were putting together newspaper articles entitled At Taliesin, and the newspaper article of uh, February 1934 uh, says, two new rooms added to, to the pageant of Taliesin's 40 rooms, merely by lowering the ceiling of the loggia and raising the roof above it to get the most playful room in the house. The boys call it a scherzo. Uh, the boys, he's referring to fellow male apprentices. Scherzo is a musical term. And uh, the apprentice keeps writing. He says, this is little eight-year-old Yovana's room. Until now, she was the only apprentice who didn't have his or her own room. So this is the drawing of Yovana's bedroom. And it was uh, around that chimney. And one of the things about this drawing uh, that I wanted to show is uh, that there are two little doors that he put in. And there's also a, um, a loft that we'll see later uh, in one of the photographs. And I'll take you outside of the building for a moment. And that's where Yovana's bedroom was at the time that this photograph was taken. Uh, one of the things that I realized about the creation of this room was that the construction that occurred for Yovana in 1933 and 34 actually set up a cascade of changes at Taliesin. Um, and the, there are actually about five or six changes that happened as the result of the construction here of Yovana's room. 
So we're going to pop onto the other side of the building. We're looking at the west facade right now, west, southwest. Uh, then we'll go over to the east facade. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what went on on the other side of the building, uh, right around Yovana's room. And then I'll also uh, show you some of the changes that he made to his own bedroom as a result. Uh, but the roof that you can see here, right around the arrow, it's uh, kind of decorative looking and um, it doesn't seem that you could open up or that you could walk out to this little area here, surrounded by stone. But you can today, and because there was a door placed there, right where you can see that arrow. And I think that Frank Lloyd Wright put that door in for Yovana. And the reason why I think that doesn't have to do with anything that anyone has written or anything that appears in a drawing. Frank Lloyd Wright was a little bit frustrating with his drawings at Taliesin. Sometimes he did things and he didn't put things in drawings. Uh, but the reason why I think the door was put in for Yovana has to do with a, a woman who used to be friends with Yovana. Uh, when I first started working at Taliesin, at the same time that I first met Heather uh, in 1994, I uh, was talking to this woman named Germaine, Germaine Maiden, and she was friends with Giovanna when they were little. Uh, Yovane, excuse me, Germaine was around three years older than Giovanna. And, uh, but Jermaine told me that when they were kids, she used to hang out and sunbathe uh, right off of Giovanna's bedroom. You can see there's where the little um, terrace would be. And thinking about this later, I realized, you know, Germaine uh, left the fellowship upon marrying her husband. Uh, she married an apprentice named Rowan Maiden. And uh, she left the fellowship in 1940. So when Germaine was 18 years old. Uh, and then there would be changes made later to Yovana's bedroom. But uh, he had to have put a door in there uh, that's not shown, that was not in that earlier photograph or earlier aerial photograph that I showed. So, so he makes the bedroom, he uh, puts the door uh, so that his daughter could go out. And then he also makes changes to his bedroom as well. So we're gonna, uh, go over to where his bedroom would have been. And he uh, pops out part of the, the room right where the arrow is. He moves a portion of the wall out so that it is supporting the roof above it. And he puts a clear story uh, against the chimney of, the, of his bedroom. By the time this photograph was taken, it was 1933, of course, he was married to Mrs. Wright and this was their bedroom at that time. By adding the clear story, it adds a little bit more light into the room, but I think he's also doing it for uh, other reasons as well. I'm gonna show you that uh, earlier photograph of the Wright's bedroom. And you can see how the uh, ceiling angled down to end at the chimney. 
And then of course he's going to pop it up here. But the reason why he uh, changed the ceiling may have had to do with what he was doing on the west side of the room at the same time, which may have been related to building a bedroom for Giovanna. Um, the west side of the room is, is the left side on, on the photograph. And you can see in this photograph that there's a door on the left side of the photograph. That's not the door into the room, that is a closet door. Um, there were three closets on the west side of the room, right around the bed. Uh, but that is not the way it is today. Those closets would have been where this uh, screen is. And on the west side of the room, there's also this loft. And it occurred to me one day that Frank Lloyd Wright took the closets out when he added the loft. He added the loft because of these two doors here. Now, I don't know if he added the doors when he had construction done on his, be uh, his daughter's bedroom, but uh, when his daughter's bedroom was put upstairs, if he had the two doors there, it would make sense for someone to put a loft there because their eight-year-old daughter was now living upstairs. And, you know, an eight-year-old child, is, you know, has, has got a good sense about them, but they, they would probably want to play. So uh, he would add this loft here uh, to create a, a play space. Now, I can say personally, I've been on that loft, uh, not to play, but to uh, clean, actually. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, it's not a lot of fun to stand up there as a full-grown full adult, uh, but I think it would fit pretty well for an eight-year-old child. Uh, now, when he made the changes and he uh, moved out the closets, what did he do with the closets? Or did he have closets in the bedroom? He did, and uh, later would. But uh, we come back to this part of the room that he, he punched out and the arrow is looking right at a solid piece of the wall right there because the arrow is looking at what was the outside of the room's closet. And I've got a... Um, a close-up drawing that shows the bedroom and there's the closet door. And actually it, that drawing says uh, C-L-O-S for a closet. So um, it was only when I was looking at this drawing, I think, is when I started to put all of this together that the closet was added because the three closets on the west side of the room were taken out. The three closets on the west side of the room were taken out because Frank Lloyd Wright had added the loft and he added the loft for his daughter. Nowadays, when you go to Taliesin, of course, you don't see that closet I, I mentioned before. Um, the room just goes straight out to uh, the terrace that exists today. So I'm gonna show you how the terrace looks today that you're looking at. Now all of this went on when um, Giovanna was eight years old, as I said. Uh, there were changes made to uh, the building also uh, in the 1940s, but that's not part of this discussion. Um, I'm going to show you uh, changes that were made to Taliesin when uh, Giovanna was an adult. 
I don't know how long Yovana uh, used the bedroom. Uh, we do know that Yovana uh, did get uh, married and keep living at Taliesin. In 1955, uh, she, uh, excuse me, 1954, she married an apprentice named Arthur Piper. And so they moved into a, a part of the building off of the tower at Taliesin. So that, there's the tower there on the right. And on the left, you see that part of the building. That part of the building uh, was originally reconfigured for Frank Lloyd Wright's secretary, Eugene, Eugene Masselink. Uh, but uh, Jean didn't use the space very much. And it was moved in into by Yovana. Uh, I'll show you what that space looked like uh, before it was used as a living space. Uh, we're looking at a drawing of uh, that long low section off of the tower. Uh, and at that time, it was actually uh, dining rooms, as you can see labeled. And then on the far west side, it was an open screened area, which was probably pretty pleasant to be in. Um, and then the changes were made for Jean Masselink. The room was expanded. And what was a dining room with the screened in porch became a, a living room. What had been the kitchen area became a bedroom, where what was a sink became the bathroom, and then there was another uh, little study here. Um, by this time, uh, by the 1950s, Frank Lloyd Wright, Yovana, uh, and the Taliesin Fellowship were not living in Wisconsin in the winter which uh, is very fortunate, I think, for them, because the area that they had that they had reconfigured for Yovana uh, has stone walls on the outside. It has stone on the floors. It's probably very pleasant to be in during the summertime, uh, but uh, probably not the best uh, place to be in during the winter time. Um, so, so that is where Yovana uh, ended up staying, probably through the end of Frank Lloyd Wright's life. Uh, Yovana would live until September of uh, 2015, and so she was just under 90 years old when she passed away. And here she is with her parents in her father's bedroom. So. Um, I think I've given you a pretty good uh, background story. So uh, thank you for letting me talk. And again, thanks to Monona Terrace and to Heather for giving me this opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Hey. Wonderful. Some of these photographs uh, I've never seen and they're just delightful. You know, you don't see right family photos too often. And these are lovely. Yeah, so yeah it, it was some work to try to <laughs> Find. And uh, I was so happy when I found that one that I started off with of Yovana as a young girl and her parents. It's and her father like smiling. It's not <laughs> yeah. that he doesn't smile. Look, he's smiling right there in the last <laughs> yes. photo. So. Yeah, that was a great one to write it. So now we'd like to spend just a few minutes with questions. And if you haven't yet entered years in, I would encourage you to do so. We already have a few. Good. And, you know, just personally, Karen, somebody observed that um, your name might be Irish. <laughs> and, and given rights, Anglo ancestry, any relation? <laughs> no, not as far as I know. No. 
I don't even think any of my ancestors married uh, anyone named Jones. So. <laughs> Now's your chance to self mythologize if you like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you have been pronouncing uh, Ivana's name, Yovana, almost with the with a Y. We just had a question about the pronunciation. Yeah. Is that how how it was said in, in family and? Hopefully I'm correct. I, the, um, if uh, if Indra Berenson is is on here, I would I meant to call her or write her. I've been told both Yovana and Yovana, um, and when I've asked, some people have said yes, it's it's Yovana, like like a Y, okay. like uh, Yocasta. I think is is another name where I've seen where it's I O and it's spelled like a Y. Okay. I have to hope that I'm correct that way. If not, I apologize. <laughs> uh, where did where did the store? Excuse me. Where did the stone for for Taliesin come from? The stone from Taliesin uh, came from a stone quarry uh, about a mile away from where the structure stands now. And uh, as far as we know, Frank Lloyd Wright emptied out all of the stone. So it's, it's not really in use or you can't really use the quarry anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael wonders about um, how you showed a photo, it might have been the same photo that referenced the Utah Historical Society at the bottom. Any thoughts on how they landed there? Yeah, I actually have the story on that. Um, <laughs> okay, uh, when Frank Lloyd Wright started Taliesin, he brought a long, young draftsman, a man named Taylor Woolley. And Taylor Woolley um, is the one who took the photographs. And Woolley went, was from Utah. He went back to Utah, uh, had an architecture practice for decades. And uh, when he passed away, or I'm not sure exactly when he passed, uh, but um, he kept the negatives of the photographs and he gave them to the Utah Historical Society. Uh, he also gave prints of those photographs to his architecture partner, a man named Clifford Evans. And Clifford Evans gave his collection to uh, the Utah uh, University of Utah. And those photographs uh, were the photographs at the, excuse me, the photographs at the Utah Historical Society were found by Ron McRae. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so Ron McRae found them and he got copies of them and uh, he had, th this is how I ended up assisting on building Taliesin, is uh, I helped him with the captions of the photographs. Uh, and uh, he also uh, gave me, or he also just advised me that I could go to the Utah Historical Society and show them. Um, if you want to, I can, well, do you think I should go back all the way? to that photograph. Oh, you can return to that slide, sure. Oh, sure. And we mentioned it in the introduction, but the name of Ron's book is Taliesin, excuse me, Building Taliesin, Frank Lloyd Wright's Home of Love and Loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> There's your explanation. Uh, someone asked if, if you know the source of the, the film by Alden Dow. Or could 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 one go and view it? The the still photograph you had. Yeah, if you look back at the the slide that I showed, um, I have the URL, the the um, 
the website address on there. Uh, that film, uh, excuse me, that film is, um, you know, was taken by Alden Dow. It is actually own, owned by the Alden Dow Foundation. However, in Germany, apparently, they have it and stream it or not stream it all the time, but they, but they have it online. And so I was able to go and find it and take some screenshots and hopefully show it before we all get in trouble and the Dow Foundation comes running after us telling, telling us not to do that. But yeah, so the URL for where I found it is on the bottom of the slide there. That's now it, it could it could be just the fact that I have a toolbar at the bottom that hides that, but actually I can't see it, so I might want to um, oh get okay. that. I, I wonder if our viewers are also unable to see it. Um, is that something that is like a lot of letters and numbers that we would want to yeah put yeah. in put in the box later maybe? Um, yes. Okay. Got yeah, it. I not, can send it to an no URL. Okay, we'll try to we'll try to um, get that out to people. Yeah, sorry. About and the that. other option is to go back and view it when it's um, archived, and you can more likely see it there. I'm guessing. Um, Anne asks, who rendered these drawings of the rooms? Right, himself or Wes Peters, some other apprentice? And you have several, so it might depend. Which one? I don't know. I'm really bad on knowing who did these drawings. So I apologize. I can't answer that question. Well, I imagine it's very difficult to track. Um, so, yeah. Some Francophiles, you know, that they, they're really good at figuring out who did the drawings. And I, unfortunately, have not done that. Uh, Thor says Frank dies in spring of 1959. When was the house last occupied by a right relative? Right relative. Um, Mrs. Wright, Olga Bonna Lloyd Wright, uh, kept coming to the house, um, I guess. She would have been at the house the last time in the fall of uh, 1984. I mean, I have met right relatives who have come and visited Taliesin, but of course, you know, they, they haven't lived there. Okay, great. Brock asks, could you speak more about the construction of the current terrace off Yovana's bedroom or apartment and the later growth of that space above the garden room and loggia? What about it? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that that was... me to read it one more time. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I forgot that. Of course, we're doing like a Zoom. Uh, we're doing a. I'm doing a Zoom presentation, and Brock is not able to ask me specifically. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I mean, he can. You know, he can write me, and you know, but. Um, from what I can figure out, at least according to uh, the, the article in Ad Taliesin, uh, the right design to this probably in the spring of 1933. Construction, as you can see, is going on during the uh, summer of 1933. And then um, they, you know, completed it and had the homecoming or yeah, the room opening for Yovana uh, in February of 1934. Um, I don't know structurally what we can say about uh, where the weight was being put into the room. I do know that uh this part of Taliesin is about 
two feet taller. Yeah, it's about two or three feet taller. Uh, and uh, if you stared at Taliesin, um, you know, from the ground and looked up and stared at Taliesin, which I've often done, um, you would see that there was newer stone work right along here uh, about where he added the roof. I don't know where he would have gotten the materials. I don't know if it was uh, from wood that they were uh, milling on the estate. They might have been just because they did a lot of that in the early 1930s when Frank Lloyd Wright and the Taliesin Fellowship didn't have a lot of money, but I don't know otherwise. Uh, as for the glass, I believe that I have read that Frank Lloyd Wright uh, had glass donated to him uh, from, oh, what is it? Phillips? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the glass came from. So, thank you. Yeah. Um, you, Heather, and everybody who's now listening has just learned how Kieran Murphy answers questions when she has no idea. <laughs> I just keep out. talking and talking and talking and trying to come up with an answer. You're working it out out loud. That's okay. <laughs> So shout out to Craig Jacobson who posted the Alden Dow video URL in the in the Q&A box. If you were unable to view it, it's there. Oh, thank you. Craig. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Craig. <laughs> if you're making comments and we're getting um, many compliments, uh, I do pass all of this along to, to Kieran. Um, there's a question here. Why is the former Frank Lloyd Wright bedroom now painted pink? It is kind of a... <sighs> Coral salmon color. Yeah. Any ideas on that? No, I do not. I do not know. And we've never dug down enough to to Taliesin preservation uh, has never dug down enough on that wall to figure out what the layers of color are. And so and I've never heard anything. Uh, and at some point we might have to, or the preservation crew will have to do, uh, would have to do work on it to see what the original colors were. So. Indira says, you're, excuse me, I have a little feedback on my end. I don't know if you can hear it, so apologies. Uh, Indira says your pronunciation for Yovana is correct. So. Yay! Thank you, Indira! <laughs> When did Taliesin begin to give tours? I believe the house was opened right around 92. Was that, uh, I'm going off of my own memory, which is Your unbelievable, own memory, but that's yeah. a pretty good guess. Yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're right. I think it was like 91 for like eight tours and then 92, maybe 16 and. And prior to that, it was, just the school building that was open and then the, the garden tour that you could take through the property. Yeah, yeah, uh, did you do that? I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to ask you a personal question, but were <laughs> you part of the, because uh, you- I, you I did work. walking tours for a while, yeah, yeah. Um, where are Yovana's children located and are they involved with Taliesin? And actually another person asked if she had children. Uh, Yovana had a daughter named Eve, and uh, I believe the last time I heard, Eve is in uh, South America, but I'm not sure which country. Um, and I think it was just the one that she had. Mm -hmm. Where is the bird walk overlook edition during this time? I'm a little confused by that question as I read it. Where is the bird walk overlook edition during this time? Uh, maybe he, time in history, I guess, is what he's saying. The the the, sp the time you spoke of with editions. Oh, um, oh, that's that. 
that's great. Thank you for helping me puzzle that out. Uh, the bird walk was added in like 1952 because Tony Putnam, who you who uh, worked on Monona Terrace, uh, he came in 1953, I believe, and he told me one time that when he came as an apprentice, the the bird walk did exist. Hmm. So it must have been constructed by that time. And David Dodge worked on uh, the Loja Terrace right off of the Bird Walk. And the, that would have been in 1950-51. So that Loja Terrace was added in like 15, and then they started doing work on the bird walk in like 51, 52. Mm -hmm. Did Yovana receive any formal education outside of Taliesin? Was she in public school or do we know? I know she was in public school, but I don't know if she went to college. I don't have the, I don't have that information right in front of me. I have a question here about Taliesin and winter. And the question is, during Wright's time, was, was the property basically abandoned or did some stay behind and take care of the buildings during Wright's lifetime? My understanding was that when the fellowship would go down to Taliesin West, uh, they usually had at least one caretaker mm -hmm. uh, stay on the, at the buildings and check on things. Uh, when I first started giving tours in 1994, uh, there were two people who lived on the Taliesin estate during the winter time. Uh, there's a question about the harp in the living room at Taliesin. Do you know about the harp and the, any background about it? Did Giovanna play it? We were told that it was Giovanna's harp, so I'm guessing she would have played it, but I've never seen any information in detail about that. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't know when it was acquired. Okay. We have a, a attendee who is a harpist, so she's particularly curious about that. Oh. Uh, there's a, a, a again kind of a personal question about whether you knew Francis Nempton, who had given this person a walking tour of the grounds in 1994. Oh, so that's, wow, that goes way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I knew Francis Nempton, um, and she she lived at the property and split her time between both Taliesin and and Taliesin West. The, until she passed, correct? Yes, yes. Thank you for that, Heather. Yeah. She was the, uh, what, what would we say, oversaw the gardens basically for many years. Yeah, she was a master gardener and uh, she had a stroke in the late 90s and, but, and that's when she began to do a uh, large overseeing of, of a cadre of gardeners who would take care of the gardens. Mm -hmm. It's really fantastic if you come to Taliesin today and you can see all those gardens uh, and you've got to realize that Francis Nempton did all of the gardens at Taliesin and at the Hillside School by herself <laughs> until she had her stroke. Um, actually, uh, now that we're talking about Taliesin, um, I forgot to mention uh, tours are still, their tour season is still going on right now at Taliesin. Uh, and you can look up uh, information on tours of Taliesin by going to taliesinpreservation.org slash tours. And I, I assume visitation goes 
daily through October, but perhaps only just um, more infrequently in November, right? Yeah, you're right. I think this year they are ending on October 31st mm -hmm. because okay. of the health situations and, and pandemic. So they've been they've been doing what they can and keeping going. Uh, I do have a question from Lewis, who is curious about the screen that we see uh, of Wright's bedroom that is above the headboard. Yeah. Do you know about the artist? I don't know the name of the artist. Obviously, he was Japanese. Um, the screen is called Street Scenes of Kyoto, and it was painted in, I believe, the 1800s. Um, if you go to Taliesin today, what you see is a photo of, uh, or a, a photograph of the actual screen because uh, that room is uh, particularly bad to climate control. Hmm. Oh, I know. It ha the screen has been restored, but... Uh, Again, I, I can't remember the name of the artist off the top of my head. Patrick asks, what about the rendering, the color rendering of Taliesin that you showed? Do you know who did the color rendering? Color rendering. You mean the, the oh, not the black and white drawing, but the other. No, who would have done that drawing in 1925? I don't know if Frank Lloyd Wright did all of the drawing himself. I mean, it would seem to make sense that he would have to because he didn't have a lot of people working for him at that time. And obviously he knew how to do drawings. So, <laughs> but I don't know, unfortunately. Uh, to follow up on a previous question, Indira says that Yovana didn't go to college, but public schools in Spring Green and to uh, a school in Arizona that is spelled J-O-K-A-K-E. I'm not sure how to say that. <laughs> and Brock confirms that Taliesin will close uh, October 31st. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thanks this, is, both this of you. is what's great about Q and A is that people will jump in and confirm or help answer questions. Yeah, um, yeah. And it, awesome. it, Indira does say that Yovana played the harp very well and took lessons in New York. Cool. Well, we have um, many nice comments here and affirmations <laughs> and things that I can certainly send along to you, Kieran. I am going to take just one more question for the sake of time, kind of a good one to go out on. And uh, if I didn't answer yours specifically and it's a burning question, maybe I can pass these along to Kieran later. <laughs> Is that okay? Um, oh, definitely. I have a question from Julie that uh, asks, Frank Lloyd Wright is so thoroughly studied by people like you. Are there any gaping holes to his life that you or others would still like to research or that might be discovered? Wow. <laughs> ended with a bang there. <laughs> what? <laughs> I ended with a bang there, kind of a, a thoughtful question, but is there anything that you're currently maybe doing work on that you're Oh, well, I'm always do, uh, write, continuously writing about the history of Taliesin itself. Because um, I can't seem to stop myself. Uh, <laughs> well, that's to our benefit. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but any large gaps? I don't know. There's is, uh, certainly for you that would probably be a, related to Taliesin specifically. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. And, you know, 
the, the research out there is incredible for all aspects of rights, work and life. Um, I noticed today there were no less than three virtual presentations at right sites. And luckily we had all just probably really by luck and not by strategy because I did not talk to these other sites, but they were all at different times of the day. <laughs> one, could, one could spend the whole day doing this. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I know when I first started doing uh, research on Taliesin at Frank Lloyd Wright's archives, which used to be at Taliesin West in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, I went down there, talking about Taliesin, I went down there hoping to find correspondence that Frank Lloyd Wright had had with the actual people who were doing the construction on his house. And there really isn't any, not that I could find. And I realized, of course, that he was mostly there on site. Uh, so he could just tell the workmen what to do. And of course, I've also wondered if I were to figure out a way to dig around the trash heaps around here to try to find the drawings of all of the, I mean, because he was constantly making changes, but there are no drawings. Mm -hmm. He had to have had drawings. I mean, <laughs> I mean not full out, um, technical drawings that you would do in a drafting studio, but he he would make sketches and he would tell people what to do. And um, I haven't found them. There are also uh, some drawings at the Wisconsin Historical Society that I haven't fully looked for. So I, I guess drawings would be the thing that I would love to have. Right. Drawings of Taliesin. Well, the information keeps flowing in and I feel not negligent if I don't mention a couple more things, okay. sorry. Yeah, I'll uh, uh, Indira Bernson, who by the way is uh, located at the Frank Lloyd Wright archives, she has graciously said for more information on Yovana and the harp, you can contact her. And so I hope that our guest who was asking about the harp is still with us. Um, if not, uh, she, everybody on this call today will get a follow up email tomorrow asking about their experience. So you could follow up with me there. But if you are curious, go to the Q&A section and look at this post. And then finally, I'll close with uh, Cindy, who says, my niece and I, who I introduced to Frank Lloyd Wright several years ago, we're privileged to have you as our tour guide on the big four hour tour. <laughs> Wow, that was that, quite a while ago. That flew like 30 minutes, she said. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for sharing your deep well of knowledge and insight with us all. So that seems like a good way to close today. That's um, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Yeah, so, you know, we at the Right Sites are all just hopeful that we can see you in person, you know, at Taliesin, you can do so the next few days. And then next year, hopefully we'll have more robust access. Um, and we look forward to seeing you live and in person. <laughs> but in the meantime, this is a great way to, to swap information and ask questions. And Karen, thank you again. You did a wonderful oh. job. And we really appreciate picking your brain and learning more about the building. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Thanks for attending today. Bye. Bye-bye.